All right, um, well, welcome everybody out there as we uh, enjoy the uh, vagaries of Hubelo and uh, Zoom. Uh, before we begin, I want to remind everyone that ARSC is a nonprofit organization managed by volunteers dedicated to the oh. preservation and study of sound oh. of all types. If you are an ARSC member, please consider becoming more involved by taking on a volunteer role. That's very important to us. Uh, and you can contact any uh, board member uh, to find out more about that or <laughs> Georgitis, our executive director. If you're not an ARSC member, uh, please consider joining during our conference special, which is running right now, just $25. Uh, the special runs until June 15th. It'll give you access to hundreds of hours of uh, past conference recordings, the RS Journal, and a lot more as well. Uh, and throughout this session, uh, you're welcome to type in and send questions to us. Uh, I do ask you to use the uh, Q&A feature at the bottom of your uh, screen or on the right-hand side of your screen, uh, and uh, as opposed to the chat session. Uh, that's what we will monitor, hopefully. Uh, between sessions, you can also meet and chat with other attendees in the Hubelo Lounge. All right, so uh, for this session, we're going to talk about the uh, Landmark Music Modernization Act. Uh, it was passed in, 19, uh, in uh, 2018. Uh, key provisions of it just became effective as of January 1st of this year. And among those key provisions that are of uh, particular importance to archivists as, as well as to private collectors uh, is that, as I'm sure many of you have heard, it uh, establishes a full public domain for pre-1923 recordings, uh, which the United States has never had. We're way behind the world in that. Uh, so any recording uh, released before 1923 is now public domain. Uh, and in future years, starting in January of uh, 2024, additional years will be added to that, 23, 24, 25, and so forth. Uh, second major provision is the possibility of using out of print and orphan works uh, uh, recordings uh, in certain circumstances. You have to go through certain hoops that have been set up to the, by the uh, Copyright Office. Uh, but if you do that uh, and you make a diligent search and you post a notice about it and the rules that they've set, set up uh, and nobody objects within 90 days, which nobody will if it's a true orphan work, uh, then you're free to use that for nonprofit purposes, uh, free of any uh, threat of lawsuits and so forth. Uh, in addition, uh, because this ex extends finally federal uh, coverage to uh, all recordings, not just those after 72, which used to be the case. Uh, it extends essentially federal fair use exemptions, 107, uh, section 107 exemptions. Fair use is a very powerful tool, as I'm sure uh, some of you know, for the use of recordings in scholarly purposes. Uh, and it extends most of the library and archive exemptions too, the section 108 exemptions that are so important to libraries and archives. Uh, now, I know that some of these things have been done anyway. We've been digitizing things and, and using things, um, but there are many uh, attorneys and uh, institutions that are, get very nervous when they get around copyright. Sometimes they make it impossible to do what you, what you know your mission is to do. Uh, and if nothing else, this should make, give them some uh, degree of uh, certainty that there are now some firm dates uh, and some firm um, federal laws that allow these things that we should have been doing all along. So uh, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Uh, Eric can go into a little more detail on it and certainly will be invaluable to us when we get to the uh, Q&A part. Uh, I do very much encourage you to uh, think of your questions as you go along. Uh, each of our experts is going to talk a little bit about how the uh, uh, Music Modernization Act has, has helped them and can help them, uh, but we want it to help you as well. And we're going to devote the, um, at least probably half this session after the speakers are through to uh, answering your questions and addressing your issues. So our first speaker uh, on the panel is going to be Eric Harbison. He's a vocal advocate for copyright interests of libraries and archives and is a frequent writer and presenter on the subject. He holds a master's degree in music from Cleveland State University and in library and information science from the University of Illinois. 
After a 30 year career in libraries, uh, he is currently pursuing, pursuing a Juris Doctor degree, an attorney's uh, degree from the University of Oregon. Eric? Hi, so uh, I am, since I, I'm time limited to five minutes, I'm not going to bother to share uh, slides with you, but um, I am going to give a little bit more overview of the provisions of the Music Modernization Act, and then everyone else can fill in what they're doing. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to say is that the, the Music Modernization Act is really three bills in one. Uh, the, most of the, the act concerns music licensing of musical works, which in some cases is also useful. We're going to talk mostly today about the Classics Protection and Access Act, which is Title II of the MMA, and that's the pre-1972 sound recordings provision. Uh, and then there's a third part of the bill that was for music producers, which I'm not going to touch on. Uh, so like Tim said, one of the most important parts of the Classics uh, Protection and Access Act, or CPAA for short, um, is the introduction, introduction of, well, first of all, protection, federal protection for pre-1972 sound recordings. And as a, a, a corollary to that protection, is the ex expiration of protection. So we, we have federal protection now and that protection expires. And then after that, as Tim said, uh, we can uh, do stuff without permission. Um, the term of protection varies depending on when the recording was published. It's not fixed, but published. And that's an important uh, thing to keep in mind. The recordings that were published before 1923, like Tim said, are now expired. Those are free to use. Uh, from works, pub, recordings published between 1923 and 1946, the, the term of protection is 100 years, expiring at the end of the 100th year. Uh, from 1947 to 1956, that term of protection is 110 years, um, expiring at the end of the 110th year. And then for all recordings, all pre-1972 recordings published after 1956, uh, those recordings ex uh, protection expires on February 15th, 2067, which um, it, you know, is what it is. Um, so again, two things about that, that term of protection. One is that it's based on publication date, not fixation date. So there's a question about whether something is, when something is published, uh, so that, that's a, 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 a thing to, to keep in mind. And all unpublished recordings, as a uh, corollary to that, are protected and through 2067. If it's not a published recording, um, it doesn't expire until 2067. The second, so I'm going to talk mostly about the things that are different from the rest of copyright. Like Tim said, fair use, uh, the the section 109 first sale doctrine, uh, most of the library exceptions, the section 110 teaching provisions, all of those also apply to pre-1972 recordings. I'm talking about the things that are different between pre-1972 recordings and the rest of copyright. And the, there are kind of three things. The first one is uh, uh, one provision within the section 108 library provisions, which is very exciting. Section 108 gives libraries and archives extra latitude to, uh, to, to distribute, to reproduce, to display, to perform works in the last 20 years of copyright. Well, for the purposes of pre-1972 recordings, all recordings fixed before, 15, before February 15th, um, 1972 are considered to be in the last 20 years of copyright. So, that section 108H provision that only applies for say musical works or literary works for the last 20 years of copyright. For pre-1972 recordings, it applies to all of them, regardless of when they were, and that's based on fixation. Um, so, so the fixation date. Um, the second uh, important provision, this is what, what Tim was referring to with orphan works, um, is in section 1401C, um, and I can share links to statutes if you want, but I don't think you probably need that. Um, it, it's uh, 
provides a safe harbor for use uh, for non-commercial use. It has if you're making a non-commercial use of a recording of a pre-1972 recording, and the recording is not being commercially exploited, you can send a description of what you're going to do to the copyright office and you file a notice with the copyright office. And like Tim said, if after 90 days, the copyright owner hasn't objected, then uh, you can proceed with your project within the parameters that you specified in your proposal. Um, the two requirements uh, for are you have to make a good faith search of the copyright office's database of pre-1972 recordings, which I'll get to in a second. And the second is you have to make a good faith search of, and I'm quoting, services offering a comprehensive set of sound recordings for sale or streaming. Um, that, that's the requirement. The Copyright Office has done a rulemaking session where they have uh, made a, a series of recommendations of things that you do uh, if you follow the Copyright Office's uh, rulemaking, then you, you you have made a good faith search. Everything that you uh, the copyright office requires may not be required under the statute, but but that's a, a an ex additional safety provision. Um, and and the and the one thing that, that I'm concerned about with this provision is that non commercial use is un, undefined. So we still don't know what constitutes a non uh, non commercial use. We do know that recovery of costs is not necessarily a commercial use, but 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 that's a, a one thing to watch out for. And then finally, there's the uh, the recordation requirement under the statute, which requires people to send metadata to the copyright office to have in order to get access to uh, statutory damages. Um, I post, posted the link in the chat. Um, this is a so this is something that we don't have with other kinds of works. Uh, a, a, a reliable database where we can search and find the metadata for the, um, for the re recording. There are currently about 250,000 records in there that makes the searching really easy. Um, and you, you have to, to post uh, stuff, post your recorded, your uh, metadata there if you want to have access to statutory damages if you sue. So those are the three things that I had. Uh, I'm going to post a link also to the report I wrote for the National Recording Preservation Board, which goes into detail about all of this. But in the meantime, I will pass it over to the next person. All right, well, our, our uh, one thing I wanna mention, by the way, that I neglected to mention up front, uh, this is a change in US law. Uh, however, it applies to any recording that was released in the US, uh, and that includes many, many recordings made in other countries, of course, uh, especially in the early years. Victor and Columbia both imported masters and released them here from, from many other countries, their affiliates and so forth. Uh, that's one of the reasons why we estimated 400,000 recordings in this first tranche of uh, recordings that become public domain, pre-1923 recordings. Uh, almost half of those are recordings made in uh, Britain or Germany or other countries that were uh, by the international recording conglomerates uh, released in the US as well. So it, it has very wide uh, breadth of coverage. Now, uh, Leela Bailey is the senior policy counsel for the Internet Archive, which is a 501c3 digital archive. Uh, she leads the team responsible for the legal and policy strategies supporting the Internet Archive's mission to enable universal access to all knowledge. Uh, Lilo holds a JD degree from Berkeley Law and a BA in philosophy from Brown University. Lilo. Thanks so much, Tim. Um, this is so great. I am always excited to talk to the music folks. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time talking to people who care a lot about books, but people who care about music are also like really passionate. And so it's, it's a delight for me to get to, to spend some time with you all. Um, so I'm here today to talk about what the Internet Archive um, has been doing basically in response to the Music Modernization Act. And I think my colleague Liz Rosenberg spoke earlier today um, about our Great 78s project. That's a project that predated the MMA, um, 
and I'm not going to talk about it because Liz already covered it very, very well. So I am, I'm going to talk about other things, but I'm also happy to uh, answer questions in the chat if folks have them about the Great 78s project. Um, so what are the things that the Internet Archive has done? Well, one is the first thing that we did was we released um, something called our Unlocked Recordings uh, Collection. What is that? That is the collection that we developed using that section 108H that was expanded to all pre-1972 sound recordings. Um, after I finish talking, I'll, I'll put a link in the chat to, uh, to that collection. Um, we had already done uh, a bunch of work um, around our books collection about using section 108H. So we had a process in place for the requirements of that section, which essentially are to do this good faith search to figure out whether or not that uh, title is being, um, God, what I, I should have looked right before this, what the exact words are, because it's different than in every other provision of copyright. It doesn't say non-commercial. It doesn't, it just says whether it's in the natural or the normal course of commercial exploitation, whether it's available through the normal channels of commercial exploitation. Um, the fact that that phrase is different than every other term, uh, we can assume that maybe it means something slightly different than, for example, the way courts have interpreted what non-commercial use means under in the fair use law, for example, right? We can, it gives libraries um, a bit of room to determine for ourselves what is a reasonable search um, and what exactly does it mean for something to be in the normal channels of commercial exploitation. Um, so we developed a, a process um, for how to do that for books that then we once the MMA went into effect, we basically poured it over to music. Of course, it's different because you have to search different places. Um, but essentially, you know, we do a, a search. We look at a variety of different sources to figure out whether or not we can find it. And if we can, it goes into this cool unlocked recordings collection. Um, in preparing for this, I, I got to play around it. Um, we have a whole bunch of, you know, old timey music, Latin music. Um, I found this really weird, obscure prog rock band from the 70s that sort of sounded like, I don't know, uh, Age of Aquarius type thing from the 70s, which was super cool. We have sound effects. We have all these demo records of like stereo sound. So if you put on really cool headphones, you'll hear, it's kind of like when you're in Adobe uh, IMAX and you kind of hear the music all over the place. Um, there's the original cast recording of Sesame Street uh, is in there. Um, we've got Ukrainian country music. Oh my God, uh, right now in this moment, being able to go in there and listen to Ukrainian country music, that was such a delight to find. So we have all kinds of cool, interesting stuff that you cannot find on Spotify. You cannot find you know, on your traditional channels of uh, commercial exploitation. And I'll tell you, most of these are you know, things that were maybe printed one time or they were literally just demos that were created and were never I mean, never really released into the public um, uh, channels of commercial exploitation is the language I'll keep using. Um, so so I, I highly recommend going in and playing around in there because it's, it's a real delight. So that's basically what we worked on for the first couple of years while we were waiting for that public domain provision to come into effect because the law gave kind of a, I think it was a three year transition period um, before the public domain piece came into play. And so in January of this year, um, when the sound recordings entered the public domain, we threw a big party because that's what we do at the Internet Archive. Um, Tim was there. I think a bunch of folks uh, here probably were there. Um, and we had a celebration of sound. Yeah, exactly. Um, a celebration of sound. And we really dove into what is the value and importance of, of being able to 
hear from a different time and just understand the ways in which that affects and influences our culture and our understanding of historical moments. Um, and so that was a really special event. Um, and I'm, I'm delighted that we will continue to get new works rolling into the public domain every year until 1946, when we will get a 10 year drought. <laughs> um, which is a real bummer, uh, but we will have a 10 year drought and then works will flow for 10 years. And then in 1956, we'll get another drought uh, until uh, 2067. Um, so uh, yeah, so, so excited that things are gonna be flowing back into the public domain. And what's wonderful about that is not only can the internet archive make that available as we do under the unlocked recordings provision, um, the difference between relying on 108H and the public domain is our users can then take that and do whatever they want with it, right? The public domain means anybody can, you can issue reprints, you can, you can remix it, you can do all kinds of, you can put it as a soundtrack to a movie, um, all kinds of things um, are allowed once you're in the public domain. Um, Section 108H only applies to libraries. So only libraries get to make that available and you kind of have to go through your library to have access to it. Um, so it is, it is a more limited provision, but at least, hey, at least there's access. Um, and, and we think that's pretty darn cool. Um, we also love that fair use applies um, to, um, to these works more clearly now. Um, I was of the opinion that it probably applied even before the law, that if you really went to court, you could make the argument. But now it is crystal clear in federal law that fair use does apply, which means we get to do the same kind of creative, innovative thinking about our music collections as we have been able to do about all of our other collections, including books and software and images, right? Um, so all of that is, is awesome and cool. Um, I have some complaints about the MMA. I'm just gonna give two lines on, on why I think it's still not good enough and why we should still be bugging our members of Congress for more for the public. Um, this non-commercial limitation is deeply problematic for access to our culture and especially for uh, educational institutions that teach music, that study music, the history, the ethnography, um, and for future musicians to be able to have access to these materials as they are studying and as they are learning, right? Um, only having access to the stuff that's in the public domain or isn't commercially available is lame. I mean, it's wonderful and I'm glad we have it, but if you are a student of music, you need access to everything. Um, and it shouldn't be based on whether or not you or your parents or family can afford to pay for all the many, many different commercial services out there that have, um, that have music, right? Because they don't all have the same collection. There isn't one single place where you can go to for every single sound recording. There, it just isn't. You might need Spotify and Tidal and Rune and blah, 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 and on and on and on, right? So, um, so I still think there's work to do in explaining to our policymakers that we need an educational use exception for music, right? That we should be able to study music, listen to whole scores, whole compositions, whole albums, um, because that's what we need for our future musicians and the future of our culture. I'm gonna get off my uh, soapbox now and look forward to your questions. Uh, let me just uh, interject one brief question here, Leela, uh, which uh, uh, Liz uh, Rosenberg, who spoke this, uh, before us uh, on another panel uh, uh, about the great 70H projects, talked about how um, discographies were being mined uh, specifically for release information. And I assume that ties to what you were just talking about. Uh, and, the, and the end goal seems to be to use published discographies for establishing the year of release, which most discographies don't have, of course. Uh, are you, is your plan at the, at the Internet Archive to uh, tie each recording to the extent that you can to a release year? Is that what you're aiming to do? So I have to say, I'm, I have not been deep in the weeds on, on, 
on how we're using the discog discographies. Um, but I think that's right. We look at the discographies to help figure out, it's one of the sources we look at to figure out kind of year and publication dates. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm not in the, in the deep flow of how that works though. Well, to the basic question though, uh, are you planning to try to tie each recording to a release year, not a date, a release year so that casual users or teachers or whoever comes to the Internet Archive will know whether this falls within, you know, which side of the line it falls on? I genuinely don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair answer. All right. Uh, all right, we'll move on then. Uh, Mark Bailey is the director of the Yale Collection of Historical Sound Recordings, uh, is an expert in the field of musical performance practice, including the Romantic era and the recordings associated with it. Pardon the phone. Uh, as well, he is the artistic director of the American Baroque Orchestra and a Baroque vi violist. He frequently teaches and lectures on the significance of historical recordings and understanding the stylistic characteristics of musical performers of the past. Mark? Good afternoon, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with you. The Yale Collection of Historical Sound Recordings is home to over 280,000 recordings in a variety of historical and current formats, uh, including cylinders, 78s, acetates, radio transcription discs, wire recordings, reel-to-reel -reel and cassette tapes, LP, CDs, digital files, and more. Um, at the heart of the collection is opera and classical music, but as well, um, very well represented in the collection is uh, jazz, American musical theater, poetry and literature, and even historical political speeches. The use is intended, of course, uh, for teaching and learning by Yale faculty and students, as well as the broader research community. Um, one can have access to our recordings by coming into the studio and hearing the recording in, in that setting or requesting a digital copy, uh, which is delivered to the researcher with various limitations and uh, certain stipulations for its use. But I wanted to describe a project um, that benefited directly from the Music Modernization Act um, a few years back. And it was actually kind of in anticipation of the act fully going into effect. And that is we have a collection at Yale of 732 seven inch Berliners from around uh, 1900. Uh, most of you will know this, but for those who don't, these are among the very first commercially re uh, released recordings, the very first flat discs uh, to document uh, mostly singers, but also instrumentalists on recording. And it was had been our priority for uh, quite some time to digitize them. Uh, to, to address preservation. So we um, were able to locate the funding for that a few years ago. And the intention of course was to digitize them all at once and create a finding aid. But with the, the coming into existence of the modern Music Modernization Act, we also decided to go ahead and post them and have open access to them as well. And uh, whereas we do provide for some other collections uh, limited access uh, under provisions of fair use and, and so forth, we petitioned for open access to all the recordings uh, because in anticipation of the Music Modernization Act um, and our, our licensing agent, uh, licensing representative at the time went ahead and, and, and gave the K to do that. Uh, so all 732 were digitized uh, put into a finding aid, placed online, and made available for open access. And I'm going to share my screen right now um, just to give an example of that. Ah. So I, I just pulled up one page, one, one of the entries um, from the collection. And anyone, whether they're at Yale or, or outside the Yale community, can go ahead and listen to a copy by uh, clicking here and clicking the arrow, which then um, you know allows the 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 recording to stream. Now, and I don't know if you can see this, depending on on where uh, where we are placed on your screen, but then more recently, once the Music Modernization Act went into effect, uh, we added something as well, and I'm clicking right now, and that is download. So these are not only um, 
available to, to stream and, and to listen to, but one can download and have a copy as well. Um, we were able to move <clears throat> ahead with this project uh, of, of such a large scope, really because of, again, the Music Modernization Act um, covering that and um, not have to dance quite so carefully around fair use and things like that. It shouldn't have been a problem, but this, this gives us greater, greater confidence in that as well. Um, and now this enables us to move ahead with some other projects with the, uh, the, the public domain kind of uh, mindset as well. We also have a collection of several hundred non-Berliner seven inch discs from around the same time, especially Xonophones and the like. And our intention is again to digitize them, create a finding aid list, but then go ahead also and create open access to them and downloadable access as well. Um, and then finally, uh, one of the things that, that I can do now as the director to help promote the recordings in the collection pre-1923 is that I will be starting a series um, probably bi-weekly or maybe weekly where I will be posting on uh, social media a recording from the collection pre-1923 um, and as, as a way not only of course to promote the recording to invite research teaching and learning of the collection, but also to convey um, what the Music Modernization Act has enabled for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, our next speaker is gonna be Sam Berlowski. Uh, for those of you who read the um, winter edition past of the Ars Journal, uh, titled A Bus Ride in Cleveland. He was the other person on the bus ride with me. Uh, so we've been on a long journey and, and Sam had a great deal to do with the launching of ARSC's efforts to uh, change the law. Uh, and others, of course, uh, including the Internet Archive, it had a lot to do with it too. But ARSC has certainly spent 20 years on it and uh, uh, we owe him a debt, debt of gratitude, I think, for his work in this. Uh, Sam is the former head of Recorded Sound at the Library of Congress. He is once chair of the National Recording Preservation Board and retired editor of the Discography of Historical Recordings, to which he still contributes as a volunteer. Sam? Sam, you need to unmute. I wasn't saying anything that interesting, um, but, but in it, thank you for acknowledging our work together. But I really, you know, ours should be proud of itself as an organization. I mean, Tim carried the most weight of this, but there were many members who who made important contributions and ARSC funds were used for it. And ARSC should take some pride in that. Um, it's, it's, you know, I never thought I'd live to see it, and we have. So um, Tim asked me to take a look at how people are using the Music Modernization Act here in, in the United States in terms of a public domain. And um, so as Tim puts in his current bibliography, I went surfing. And, you know, there isn't a lot, to be honest with you. It's only four months old and... COVID has certainly altered the way uh, cultural institutions have operated in terms of, you know, you, you can't take your uh, preservation studio home with you when you work from home, things like that. But I point out, I want to point out a few things. Um, one is, um, well, Dave will talk about the Library of Congress, but DAR itself, the Discography of Historical Recordings, has made everything that it has already digitized that was available by streaming only. Um, David Seibert was able to flick a switch because he anticipated this and they're now downloadable or most of them are downloadable. Some of the ones that have come from contributors um, you know, await their authorization and, and agreements. But that's a big deal to me that, that we actually, you actually can as uh, you know, Leela said, you know, make new works from them, do mashups or, you know, put them in your film. Um, but I think that since we're only at the beginning of this, you know, you really do need to look at the web, you know, internationally. Um, the, of course, the Internet Archive ha has, you know, extraordinary audio holdings. Um, the British Library has put a great deal online, and I encourage people to look at what what's available there. And then I, I learned recently about Phonobase or Phonobase, I don't know how to pronounce it, .org, which is a French streaming site. 
and has hundreds, if not thousands of recordings made in Europe or France and other places um, uh, that are available for streaming. Um, I'm gonna, you know, I, I found some other materials. One of the most interesting one is, um, I, I, maybe I knew and I forgot, is Stanford University has been digitizing by scanning their piano rolls and has converted the files to MIDI files, which is, you know, really wonderful and very creative and an important uh, uh, endeavor. I, I was not able to hear the MIDIs. Now that might be because I'm not uh, internet literate or I'm not a member of the Stanford community. Um, I, I will say by and large, with the exception of the Library of Congress and, uh, the Internet Archive and University of California, it can be very hard to find the audio that's there. So um, that's another subject entirely, but it's out there and it's increasing. Um, I would, I'm going to stop here because, I, you know, maybe say some things later if there's time about some of my impressions of the Music Modernization Act and what are some of the um, so some of the opportunities available to us. Um, I am an extreme advocate of the fair use provision. Um, I have a radical interpretation I just made up. The fair use provision requires, uh, or at least one of the four criteria are to only use a part of a work and not the whole work. An MP3 file is what, 10% of the whole work. Maybe we can, uh, you know, distribute everything under fair use since MP3 is so compressed. Um, anyway, I'll see you in jail. Thank you. We have a potential breakthrough right in this panel on, on interpretation. I don't know what our uh, attorney and uh, attorney to be think of that, but <laughs> perhaps we can uh, address that later. Um, our final speaker in this round uh, is David Gibson. Uh, David is the uh, Digital Product uh, Project Coordinator for the Recorded Sound section at the Library of Congress's National Audiovisual Conservation Center in Culpeper, Virginia. <laughs> he was a member of the inaugural class of UCLA's uh, Moving Image Archive Studies Master's Program, uh, earned his degree in 2004, the same year. Uh, we had that bus ride in Cleveland, I think. <laughs> uh, as digital project coordinator, David works to make uh, digitized and born digital recorded sound collections accessible to researchers and the general public. David. Thanks, Tim. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share uh, because I do indeed have a presentation here. Uh, and let's see. Hopefully everybody can see that. Uh, but yeah, thank you for the opportunity to present uh, this year's virtual arts conference on some of the initiatives that are underway and upcoming at the Library of Congress in light of the passing of the Music Modernization Act. Um, I was recently hired uh, in this position in October of last year in the digital project coordinator position, um, just in time to take advantage of uh, some of the public domain status of sound recordings um, published before 1923. Uh, so since the beginning of the year, our focus has been primarily on two specific initiatives, uh, enhancing the existing citizen DJ platform with public domain audio content, and also adding download capability for public domain titles on National Jukebox. Uh, citizen DJ, for those who don't know, is an open source web browser application created by uh, Library of Congress 2020 innovator in residence, uh, Brian Fu, in partnership with LC Labs. Uh, the application allows users to cut up, slice, and sample public domain audio from the collections of the library uh, and the creation of new works. And due to previous copyright restrictions, of course, none of the National Jukebox uh, titles were available for porting to Citizen DJ uh, until this year. And Brian and representatives in LC Labs contacted me uh, shortly after I started in October to begin a discussion about adding public domain works to Citizen DJ. So uh, we ended up adding about um, 4,867 titles of the 16,000 that are uh, available on National Jukebox to Citizen DJ. Um, all of these recordings were published in the United States and came from collections held at LSE. So we're just kind of dipping our toe in it right now and, and kind of limiting it with those factors, but I wanted to quickly just show um, people an example. So this is uh, 
the song Are You Half the Man Your Mother Thought You'd Be from 1916 uh, in Citizen DJ. So essentially, you know, it's sampling audio from the song and adding drums and you can hopefully hear that. And you can do all kinds of, you know, you can change it to a different song to sample. So that's just one of the things that uh, we've been able to do, which is, has been very exciting. Um, also, uh, yeah, currently working with tech, the technical team to add download capability to uh, much of the public domain content available on Jukebox. Um, basically identifying the conditions in the JSON of uh, those records that will trigger uh, the download capability. So essentially doing what, um, what was done um, at uh, UCSB and uh, you know flipping a switch that will allow us to uh, to add downloads and so there's about close to 6,000 titles um, that fall into that category and again these are titles from uh, the U.S. and titles from LSE collections and these are all decisions that we made um, discussing these things with our office of general counsel uh, but toward, as we look to the future, uh, we hope to increase and enhance public domain content available on National Jukebox, um, you know, working to identify public domain content from the various collections that have already been digitized but are not yet available, uh, including content from the OK label uh, and also recordings from the Edison Historical Park and the Johnson Victrola Museum. Um, we still have a few agreements and other things to work out uh, in relation to some of these other collections, but we're hoping to uh, get those up as quickly as possible. Um, also with the increased uh, focus on access to public domain content uh, through lsc.gov, we're also looking to uh, sort of revise or, or you know, adjust our collection policy uh, so that we can leverage this new copyright status for sound recordings. And I'm hoping to work closely with our curatorial staff. Hi, Matt Barton, if you're out there somewhere, <laughs> uh, to give precedence to collections that we will be able to preserve and make accessible upon receipt. Uh, additionally, the recorded sound section is working to identify any other current public domain holdings that may fall outside of the Sony agreement uh, that we can make accessible online through our Project One portal. And uh, finally, you know, as we look further into the future, there are other initiatives that we hope to undertake in light of the MMA. Um, hoping to revisit some of the online collections that we that were added to LOC.gov many years ago as part of the American Memory Project with the goal of uh, doing some file replacement and adding download capability for those files as well, um, you know, including presentations such as the American Leaders Speak recordings uh, from World War I and the 1920 election, uh, the Emil Berliner and Birth of the Recording Industry recordings that we have available currently. Uh, and the Edison Inventing Entertainment presentation. Uh, and yes, yeah, so several, since several of these coll uh, collection materials, uh, some of these presentations contain collection materials held by a variety of library divisions. We're also hoping to work closely uh, with our partners within the library uh, on these projects to enhance public access uh, as they relate to public domain uh, content in our custody. So just, this is kind of like a pitch from, you know, the fact that this is a brand new position for the library, my position, and uh, really, I think, points towards a focus on access that hasn't really necessarily been there before. NAVCC and Cole Pepper where I work have been very much a, a preservation factory facility. That's sort of been the goal. I think that there's now, I think within the library in general and at NAVCC, a a shift towards trying to make more things accessible because otherwise what's the point of really even preserving these things. Um, so I'm very pleased to be uh, the first digital project coordinator at NAVCC um, and thrilled to be in this position at a time when the recorded sound section is uniquely poised to provide more access to historic recordings. Uh, I look forward to working with internal and external partners and expanding our efforts to make recordings available for streaming and download as they enter the public domain each year. And also working, you know, again, with uh, representatives from LC Labs and the digital humanities community to work on uh, other projects similar to what I showed you uh, with Citizen DJ, um, where we can, you know, actually, you know, reuse and repurpose and remix this audio and try to find ways to, you know, tell different stories that way. Um, but uh, again, yeah, I'm just very excited. You know, we take our, our role as keepers of the na nation's recorded sound history 
uh, very seriously and I'm very enthusiastic about working with collectors, institutions, researchers uh, to tell the story of our nation through recorded sound. Uh, the passing of the MMA allows for us to tell these stories in ways that may not have been as easily achievable in the past. So yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. And I'm happy to be on this panel with uh, others who are enthusiastic about this endeavor. And uh, thanks everyone for listening. And I guess it's time for your questions. Okay, thank you very much, uh, David. Uh, one follow-up to that. Uh, uh, you indicated that the National Jute Box would be adding uh, a button, I guess, to allow downloads for uh, those recordings that are now in the public domain, pre-23s to begin with. Uh, what's the timeline on that? Uh, well, there were emails flying fast and furious about it <laughs> basically last week, uh, partially because I knew that I had this presentation coming up and I wanted to say, <laughs> you know, I wanted to be able to say we are actively working on this. Um, yeah, like I said, right now, it's really just a matter of our technical staff, um, you know, writing the code that that sees those JSON triggers and says, uh, you know, if before 1923, if from the United States, if from the collections of the Library of Congress, then add download widget, basically. So uh, so that's kind of where we are right now. And I'm hoping that it will be, you know, in the next uh, couple of months, by the end of the summer, at least. Um, but, you know, the library, not not always the, the fastest moving <laughs> organization, but the fact that it's only been, you know, four months uh, and, we're, and we're as close as we are, I'm, I'm pretty happy about, so. It'll be soon, I promise. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask you a question similar to what I asked Leela. Um, since the law, as, as Eric has reminded us, is closely tied to release uh, of the recording, that right. piece of metadata can be kind of important. Uh, something right. has to be attached to a recording, and I'm sure the lawyers would probably send emails about this, <laughs> attached to the recording to let them know whether it's one that can be downloaded or not safely under the law. So how are you right. handling that? Well, so we're using, you know, most of the data, all of the data from for National Jukebox, at least, is coming out of Sony Project. Um, and we are essentially just using the date uh, field in, in that's coming in from, from there. Uh, and it's essentially, yeah, like I said, if it's from, you know, before January 1st, 1923, in that, in that data that's coming in as JSON, uh, into our back end of, of LSC.gov, uh, you know, that's the flag we're using. Um, so, so that date data does have to be there uh, so that we can ensure um, that, uh, that we are, you know, adhering to at least uh, those, those dates. Um, and for the citizen DJ material, the reason why there are about a thousand fewer uh, recordings that we ported out to citizen DJ than there will be to as far as what we're making available for download, is we we definitely played it really safe with that because it was our first initiative, and we wanted to make sure that you know maybe there might be a recording that was um, you know recorded in twenty two but didn't come out until twenty three. You know we were just kind of being extra cautious uh, for that particular project, uh, and so we actually capped that off uh, at. It's actually, I think, anything before 1922 in the case of the what's ported out to Citizen DJ. But um, I'm hoping that we can also, you know, just as we're each year going to be adding download capability uh, to the items that become uh, that enter the public domain on Jukebox. You know, I'm hoping we can work ideally with Brian Fu if he's if he's willing and able. Although he's technically not at the library anymore, doing his his residency. Um, you know, to add more material to Citizen DJ as well, and look for other opportunities uh, to work on similar uh, that, projects. That feel like that, that feel that you're relying on uh, from Sony, and uh, um, is that a feel that uh, what? How is that defined? Is it a recording field or a release field or what? I'm trying to remember. Sam, do you remember what, how that date is defined? <laughs> well, I'm trying to remember exactly what it says, but. Uh, well, there's a release date in DAR when when it's when we've had the time to look at catalogs and see them. Right. Um, I mean, I think also, I don't know. I, I the, <laughs> you know, so you, you can fudge it a little. By that I mean, you know, if you're concerned, wait 
wait a year if you know the <laughs> if you know the, the take that you're using was actually published and you know you know it was recorded in October of 1920 okay you know well I shouldn't say 1920 let's say 24 you know, wait, wait a year, wait till the 25 recordings go into public domain. There's something I'd like to talk about, which is what we call, in the, in the, but lawyers call acceptable risk. And I think that most um, of these projects are totally dependent on some assessments of risk. And, you know, I'll say publicly, um, the major record companies are not going after institutions for, uh, you know, violations of a, of a year of, of release date to my, they don't, they aren't aware of it, to be honest with you. They haven't a clue. They're learning from DAR and the Library of Congress as well. Uh, it is recording date, at least. That's how it's, it's written out. I just had to confirm that that was indeed, <laughs> indeed the case, but yeah. That's, All right, that's it, how it's, that's how it's presented in our, in our metadata for, for Jukebox. Okay. Well, the sense I'm getting is that uh, from, from both of you and from Sam is that um, you're, you're trying to be reasonable, but not uh, getting hung up on this. And the record labels themselves are not likely to go after somebody for, you know, uh, it was on January 1st rather than on December 20th, or, you know, that kind of close yeah. parsing of the data. Yeah, and I mean, you know, like I said, I mean, we have kind of, we set some very specific parameters right now, all through communications with our officer general counsel, you know, they know what we're, what we're up to, um, they know what, uh, you know, sort of, and how it relates to MMA. Um, so yeah, I mean, all of this is being uh, very carefully vetted too, before we, we make any of these decisions. Um, but uh, yeah, we're trying to, you know, maximize whatever wiggle room we have, but at the same time, being the Library of Congress, we're, we're playing it as, as safe as, as we normally do. <laughs> yeah, of course, of <laughs> course. Um, I'm just looking at the Q&A, which I was able to find now, and uh, let me read a few of these. Uh, Robert Browning asks, what might be some of the benefits and or challenges the MMA may have for smaller institutions? Anybody want to address that? I'll give it a go because it's something I wanted to talk about, which is um, the, uh, you know, smaller institutions have the same rights as any inst other institution. But um, we, we found in our field, and this is, you know, something we've learned, I've learned from our meetings that collaboration um, is is a key to access and and lots of other things if if an individual or a small archive has a digital file there are lots of public places they might place it if they don't have the resources to set up a streamable or download website themselves people put things on youtube people send them to the internet archive or and or like in the case of um, John Levin and the early recording initiative discussed this morning at the University of California, Santa Barbara, you know, you might find an institution that would like your digital files and will agree to post them. There are lots of opportunities for that, I think. And I think that, um, you know, regular folk like you and me can can do it if, if we have a file available to us. And, and, and should. ARSC has proved that scholarship in sound recordings has, has been a grassroots effort for, you know, almost to this day. And, and people have been creative about it and should continue to be. That's, that's a very, any, anybody else want to weigh in on that? Um, I would I would love to just jump in and say so so Sam is exactly right like collaboration if you're a small organization collaboration is is probably the best way to go the Internet Archive is super happy to work with folks um, either on bringing things into our collections or even just helping the ecosystem wherever we can. Um, I will say, so we talked about both the benefits and the challenges or the question was both. And so I wanted to address a little bit about the challenges I know we at the Internet Archive. I don't know if you think of us as a small institution, but we don't have that many people that work on this. It's really just two or three people um, who actively are working on this program. So it's it's quite small um, and it's very bespoke. So 
you might think of the Internet Archive as like, oh, we're this Internet scale platform and we do all this stuff at scale and all of that. But um, but really, a lot of this is human beings spending a lot of time looking. I mean, yes, they may use, use a script to go through and look through, say, discographies, um, right? So they may use some amount of software to help surface information. But there's a lot of human judgment that goes into that. So I think the challenge for small organizations really is just having dedicated people who have some knowledge base to be able to work through all of those requirements. Um, I think if you're a library, if that's the kind of institution you are, you are in a better position um, than say, a separate educational institution that doesn't have a library um, because you can't rely on that 108H provision. You're stuck in that non-commercial notice land, which means for every single work you want to use, you have to go through that process. Um, Eric can maybe inform me on this, but I'm, I am pretty sure that there is no way to do that in bulk. There's no way to do a single notice for say, 200 works. I think it's a it's a one by one um, assessment. You have to do a search, you have to do the notice, all of it one by one. And so that's fine if you are a school and you want to say, for example, use something in a school play, right? That's a pretty non-commercial act and you just kind of want to make sure. Um, but the timing is going to be challenging, doing it early enough to get that 90 day window, right? So you really have to project manage and plan um, all of this and having a person who's dedicated to figuring out all those minor nits that the, that the statute requires, um, I think is still quite a challenge. Um, and I will just whine again about, I think it's very silly to say that we only can make non-commercial uses of things that are non-commercially available. Nobody knows what non-commercial means. Um, everybody's confused about this. Um, and, and so it's, it's quite a difficult thing for individuals, especially who don't have access to lawyers and legal expertise um, to figure that out. So I do think that's a real challenge for smaller institutions. Um, but thankfully there are organizations like ours and wonderful people like Eric out there in the world who are really smart and very, very helpful. Um, and I'm sure all of these other folks, I haven't had a chance to work with uh, Sam or Mark or David really in the past, um, but I know for a fact that Tim and, and Eric are very, very happy to help and, and answer questions. And obviously we try to help at the Internet Archive as well. So collaboration, I think, is the, is, is the best answer. Um, Eric, did you want to say anything about that? Uh, no, I, I I agree with with Leela. It's it's especially about the bulk um, the bulk use of of the non commercial use uh, provision. And what what's maddening about that is the the office provides um, right holders the opportunity to do all of these things in bulk, but not users. And I I have yet to get a good um, rationale for that from them. Uh, also, at one point, they had said to me that they were planning on providing some guidance as to what non-commercial use is, but I have not seen that from them yet. So, the, yeah, that's really frustrated. Honestly, with the non-commercial use uh, provision, I, I don't, I don't see it's being especially useful in most instances because of all of the overhead required for it. Um, I, I like the school play example. That, that's an example of something where it might, it might work. Um, but it, it, in so many cases, either the, if you're a library, the library position, you'll almost never need the, the, the um, non-commercial use exception because the section 108H is superior in every respect. And, uh, and in many cases, even if you don't have that, uh, like relying on fair use will be at least as effective. Well, two questions for actually for you and for Lila or either or. Um, the rights holder community has made great use of automation, uh, web crawlers and things like that to suss out what they think are uh, uh, violations of their rights. And ARSC has been attacked any number of times because of what we posted on YouTube. Uh, 
usually they fail because once you take a look at it, you say, well, that's something being used in the middle of a lecture for crying out loud. And the human looks at it and says, yes, of course. But nevertheless, these crawlers are what they used uh, rather than human eyes. Uh, let's say that RSC wanted to put out, and this would be fantasy, I guess, a box set of all of the Grey Gull recordings made in the late 1920s and early 1930s. Grey Gull is a label that, as far as we know, has no owner today. Uh, it's one of the few not uh, soaked up by Sony or others. Uh, it simply disappeared from the books. Uh, therefore, it's likely orphan. Uh, it's likely that if you did post anything, uh, nobody's going to object to your reissuing Grey Gull recordings if you want to. A lot of jazz on Grey Gull, actually. Uh, so uh, if there could be a way to do the search automated uh, uh, and then pepper the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Library of Congress uh, site, the uh, 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 Copyright Office site, I should say, uh, with, you know, 5,000 <laughs> requests for uh, uses of this, could that be done? Well, it, the requests are not free. Ah. So <laughs> multiply that by, I want to say $90. Um, uh -huh. I, I, I have to look that up. I don't remember what the cost is. So, <laughs> so yeah, that's... Okay, well, <laughs> that was a good try. That's like Sam and his, his reinterpretations. Um, doesn't work, I guess. I mean, fair use is our, absolutely our strongest tool that we have. Um, you know, as far as I'm concerned, if you read the law very carefully, if you, you can't legally preserve a commercial recording if you can buy a copy on Discogs. I mean, that's in the law, and that, so, which is ridiculous. But, and, and all these institutions are doing it and they're not getting sued. And, and I think that this is where acceptable risk and also what I call safe practices, which stands for stay away from Elvis, or as one commenter said, Motown. Um, you know, if, if you're not putting up something that, if you're putting up something that hasn't been in print for 60 years, 70 years, 80 years, we know this well, as Tim's shown in his study of, 15 years ago, they're indifferent to it. They have other, you know, the, the record companies have to pay lawyers too. And I don't think they're going to devote anyone to going after someone for Grado or even, you know, 99% of any commercial recording in the United States. Now, uh, you know, the, the internet laws and, and, and safe harbors, they're all subject to change in the legislation. Congress is gunning toward the big companies and you know, YouTube's a Google company. So who knows what's gonna happen in the future? But this is where um, you know, over caution isn't gonna do it. I think it's very, if, if you're putting something up and you're not making money from it, the worst thing that's gonna happen is to take down notice, in my opinion. And okay. you know, that's a big thing. I am not a lawyer, you know. It's, well, I, I can jump in there and just say, like, can confirm on the not seeing a lot of takedown notices, right? Like, if we think about our Great 78s project, that's been in existence for quite a while, predating MMA, and nobody bugs us about it. Does not happen. So, yeah. All right. Um, I was speaking uh, recently to some uh, people at the uh, New York Public Library and asked them what they were doing. Uh, and the answer I got, and I won't vouch for this or name any names, but the answer I got was that their legal department is still looking at the law and hasn't given them direction yet. Is there any sense in this panel of how, obviously we've heard from, from uh, uh, David and, and uh, Lila, what your groups are doing, what your institutions are doing, uh, any sense of whether the, um, legal community as represented at archives and universities uh, is in fact understanding what can be done now? I would oh, guess yeah. so. I'll go, <laughs> yeah, not I was just gonna say- library, I mean, Not the Library of Congress, but right, go, right, go on. Right. Oh, oh no, right. I was just gonna say, I mean, as far as, I mean, we kind of like, you know, as soon as I got the position in October, you know, we were in, in consultation with, our lawyers at least and saying like you know by the way this is coming up 
these are the things we want to do, you know? Uh, so, I mean, we were already having the conversation like week one of my having the job basically, because we knew that we wanted to quickly take advantage of, of you know, what this meant for the jukebox, what it meant for Citizen DJ, what it means, you know, going forward um, and sort of like what it means in terms of like the infrastructure that we had to put in place to say that, you know, as soon as January 1st hits, you know, add this, uh, you know, downloads to these recordings, et cetera. So, um, and they were, you know, they read the, <laughs> you know, all the documentation, they were on board. And so uh, I think it was just a matter in our case of like, you know, getting to them a little bit earlier to say, you know, this is coming down the pike and we want to, and we want to take action on a couple of these things. I mean, the, the recordings on Citizen DJ were there, I think like on January 12th or something. Like we had, we had already kind of had everything signed off. I mean, that had it happened. I mean, for the Library of Congress, that is like astoundingly fast <laughs> to have something, you know, like ready to go like that, uh, you know, that early in this process. So again, I think it was just like a matter of, we knew that we knew that we, that we had to act if we wanted to get some of these initiatives going okay. quickly. <laughs> okay, Mark, has your institution been responsive in the same way? Yeah, it, it has been, and um, understandably, it gets enfolded under under the topic of fair use quite a bit. But um, there is uh, certainly support for it and knowledge of it. We a few years ago, in fact, we celebrated Fair Use Week with a number of seminars and special workshops. And my colleague Jonathan Manton and I gave a, a presentation on MMA, um, which was uh, probably about a year or two away at that point. And, and again, the response was uh, enthusiastic. And I think we see it as just another uh, component that happened uh, that strengthens the, you know, the kind of the fair use um, approach as well, um, adds a great deal of confidence uh, to that. And um, so at least in the library community at Yale, there's a growing awareness of it. Um, enthusiasm for it. And um, that's kind of where the decisions are made for, for those materials and certainly the historical uh, sound recordings that I oversee. And we do have a licensing uh, representative, a, a, a legal licensing person that advises on this as well. And that person's very aware of this. Okay, uh, another question that came in from Bob Kosowski uh, is, is anyone aware of anybody working on a study of how these new newly public domain recordings are being used. And your silence. Nobody's aware of such a study. <laughs> I just want to say it's a great question because, of course, now we have less awareness because people can just download them and stream them. And before, <laughs> you know, they had to go through me, and and you know, I knew what purpose uh, the, the recordings were used for. So well, I. Yeah, <laughs> I did say they, I nominate Sam for that study. I think he should get on that. Uh, <laughs> since he already, since that was kind of the impetus for his, for his uh, part of this panel. You know, he should keep get, keep rolling with that. <laughs> well, maybe somebody listening to this panel uh, can pick up on that. It sounds like it could be a rather valuable study, uh, if only to plop on the desk of a reluctant uh, uh, attorney at a uh, university somewhere uh, to show what people are in fact doing. Tim, I, I think a, a good study also might be a survey of cultural institutions' practices with regard to providing access to sound recordings. Um, I, you know, I worked in the Library of Congress for a long time, and I just found working with their general counsel. You know, I, I would say delightful. I mean, you know, I, I would go to the head general counsel and say this is what I want to do. And he'd say, well, you can't do that. It's illegal. Tell me what you really want to do and let's find a legal way. And I've seen that through uh, since the leadership, you know, later leadership of general counsel at the library. Um, one, one of the great online projects that I should have mentioned at the beginning, and I'm going to stick it in now, although it isn't commercial sound recordings, is the American Archive Project, which is the Library of Congress and WGBH. They have tens of thousands of public radio and television broadcasts streaming on the web. Every McNeil Lair and uh, News Hour uh, broadcast is there, complete. Um, that, that's just 
you know, one of the more prominent ones, but, but uh, local pro programming, lots of local programming and lots of, you know, official uh, NPR or major station television and radio programming. Again, this was worked out a, in a collaboration, and B, by lawyers who wanted to see it happen, or at least their bosses wanted to see it happen, and actively worked to do this legally. And I encourage every, anybody to look at this American Archives site. It, it, it'll blow you away in terms of the, the broad scope of content. Um, and it's the product of lawyers who are creative, yet legal, you know, and, and, and collaboration. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I can see that uh, Eric is answering some of the questions that have been posted in the Q&A. So if you're in the audience, uh, we have about 20 minutes left. Please do indeed uh, put your questions there. You may get a direct answer to them. Uh, John Lambert asked, please comment on opera and symphony broadcast recordings under the MMA. These are not formally fixed, but many are in circulation online and or in pirated releases. Are these protected or is it merely corporate lawyers who seek to <laughs> enforce restrictions? They're protected. <laughs> so um, I, I can take that if no one else wants it. Um, I, I, think that, I, I think that it's important to, to look at the terms. The, those recordings are fixed in the sense that they, they are they exist in the, like they, they wouldn't be available if they hadn't been fixed fixation is the is the putting the recording on some media that allows it to be distributed or whatever um, so the, the recordings have been fixed but they have not been as published I think now I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll if any if someone wants to correct me on this I don't think that a pirated, release is is necessarily is, is an authorized publication and um so i i don't i think that you're going to run into other problems with pirated recordings there's another provision of the copyright act uh in in section uh 1101 that deals with pirated recordings that you could get in trouble with um but uh Leela, i don't know if you have something else you want to add to that but I'm, I, I would stay away from pirated recordings myself. Yeah, I mean, again, so this is where, um, so what the Internet Archive has is the ability for anybody to upload anything, right? And then we get to use the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, um, so that if we don't know about it, we only have to deal with it if somebody notifies us, right? So. Um, we have a lot of these kinds of gray area materials that we've never received any notices about. And they're actually really pretty cool. And it seems like nobody, nobody like coming after us for those kinds of things. So um, that's a model, the DMCA, using the DMCA is potentially a model for libraries. Um, if, if you want to have sort of user-based collections where you, where folks can put stuff up and you just respond to notices when they come in. Um, that's, that's something that has been, has worked well for the Internet Archive. I will also say we have a live music archive, um, which has many, many, many bootlegged uh, recordings of, um, of, uh, of, of live concerts. But what we have in that scenario is the band knows about it and is happy to have it there right so the grateful dead kind of started this whole tradition of sharing sharing concert tapes for non-commercial uses and they kind of started this trend of having that be available on the internet archive also for non-commercial purposes and now thousands of other bands are like yeah we want our fans to be able to do that too as long as it's it's non-commercial which the internet archive is so we've managed to kind of have a couple of different ways for those materials to be out in the world in a way that we have not had any complaints about. Um, and in fact, many, many people love it and are, are really, really happy that that exists. So, you know, I would I would say the DMCA is, is an interesting thing for institutions to take a look at. Um, it's a little, 
you might have to get into content moderation. You might have to have somebody whose job it is to, you know, respond to, uh, or in fact, you will need to have somebody whose job it is to respond to any notices that come in um, for user uploaded materials. But it could be a really good trade off for an institution for mitigating an institution's risk, um, but allowing for these materials that have sort of a gray or legal status to be available in a non commercial uh, way. Uh, Leela, you answered another question on the uh, Q&A that I, I think you perhaps could uh, uh, speak to the wider audience because I thought it was a very good answer. The, the question was, is there an appetite from Congress, the music industry, the music industry, or anyone to amend the MMA going forward? So no, not right now. It's definitely was a grand bargain. Um, I will say, so what the rights holders are pushing for now is mandatory filtering, right? So that, that um, institutions, anybody running, running a website that hosts uh, copyrighted materials would have to have mandatory filters um, that were considered to be standard technical measures by some industry consensus. I'm putting big quotes around this because nobody knows what any of this means. Um, but there's something that was recently pushed um, called the Smart Copyright Act, which truly was one of the dumbest things I've ever seen come out of Congress. Um, and a lot of people said the same, but basically that's about the sort of mandatory filtering. And so what you're actually seeing is rights holders continuing to push for more and more rights, more enforcement, so that's what you're seeing on, you know, from the from the rights holder lobbies. Um, what you are seeing a lot less of is communities like ours going to Congress and saying, um, actually, the public needs access to these things, and um, we as libraries, our role, or as uh, there may be other educational institutions and other kinds of institutions that have played this role of providing access to information in a non-commercial way. And it, and it has worked, right? For many, many, the existence of recorded sound, for the existence of books, right? Libraries have played this role. Um, so the Internet Archive is always looking for friends and allies. We go on, we go and talk to congressional offices relatively regularly. Now that the pandemic has happened, you can actually get them on Zoom calls so you don't have to go to DC to talk to congressional staffers. So I truly would strongly recommend to anybody here, anybody who's you know in the audience, literally call your member of Congress, call their office, and you just literally can leave a voicemail or ask for somebody that says, hey, who, who, it, who deals with libraries and education? Um, who's the staffer that deals with that? I want to talk to them. And you have a conversation with them and you say, I'm a librarian. I'm a teacher. This is what I need. This is not working. And you just get that on the record. And you do that if we can organize around that and you get enough of a groundswell and you get a member of Congress to really care about it, like a Ron Wyden, who was absolutely essential in getting the public domain and access provisions um, into the MMA. Um, that's how, it, you know, that's how it works, right? It really does require a certain amount of organization, but you should never be intimidated to call your member of Congress and tell them what you care about, because that is literally their job. They work for you. So, you know, you let them know. <laughs> they shouldn't just be hearing from the RIAA. Thank you. I, I, uh... I hope that message gets out, uh, and and I hope that ours can continue on this. I'm sure the uh, Internet Archive will in the years to come. Um, all right. Among uh, some of the other questions that have come in, uh, uh, how do we put? This is from Tom Pease. How do we push back against content filters trying to make take down performers' recordings of public domain content? Performers' friends are finding their own recordings getting take down notices of Bach. And Mozart. Content filters. Okay, so that's what I was talking about with the Smart Copyright Act. Like, um, so right now, what the law says is that uh, there are certain way. Yeah, so so the law right now doesn't mandate filters. In Europe, they recently passed um, the Copyright Directive 
um, that has mandated content filters. Um, so in Europe, that is starting to happen. And so the rights holders are getting emboldened and they want that to happen here in the United States. Well, we at least have the First Amendment so we can push back on you know, using sort of free expression arguments. Um, but this really is a place where the Electronic Frontier Foundation, um, Fight for the Future, um, public knowledge, there are a bunch of groups that are actively working right now on pushing back against these laws that are mandating content filters. Um, I'm not sure if this question was about the law piece, but I can say that like we need a big set of people to scream about this and talk about why this is an absolute nightmare and an absolute disaster for culture, for artists, for musicians, for everybody. This is bad, 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 and we need to push back. So I'm sorry, I'm soapboxing like crazy today. Um, but this is an area where if you want to be a part of that coalition, please feel free, I'll put my email in the chat. Please feel free to reach out directly to me and I can just connect you to the organizations that are doing um, grassroots organizing around this because they can really use the perspective of music librarians, archivists, um, folks that, have been historically providing access to these materials that are running into these problems. Your stories actually can make a difference when folks go to Congress and say, this is why this is bad. We need concrete, real world stories of harms. So documenting those harms, documenting the ways in which this is problematic for, especially for performers. If that's happening, that's something that, um, needs to be documented because that's the kind of thing that no staffer in Congress is ever going to hear about unless you tell them. I have kind of a, a funny anecdote along those lines. I got a takedown notice for a 78, I think it was like 1920, 1921, and they cited the copyright owner. Um, it was a, a, a recording label and it, it showed the LP with um, that particular recording on it. It turns out that was, they, they used our uh, recording to make uh, to make that LP that was actually our copy uh, that they they used and uh, but there was no arguing that there, there was no way to do that so I just we just took it down but so we uh, violated nothing obviously why so, did you take uh, it down um, it, it was it was one of the things we we needed it for an event and we weren't going to have time to you know by the time you argued it and all that it, it we just decided um i i rarely take them down but that one i did just because i i didn't have time to uh have the back and forth with i think it was it was either soundcloud or youtube and it was, it was just very messy um if 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 I weren't limited by time i i would have i would have disputed it. and i've disputed other ones and it was okay so I'd like to um, amplify what Leela was saying about grassroots organizing by saying uh, two things. First of all, the Music Modernization Act, the, the, at least the Classics Act, which is what we're mostly talking about, um, started out as a terrible bill. It was terrible. It passed the House with only two votes against it as a terrible bill there was no first there were there were no there was no fair use there were no, like there was fair use only in a very limited capacity which would have been useless there was a there was uh section 108 provisions that were even less useless or even more useless rather it was bad and the fact that we're talking about this bill as a celebration as good news is um is proof positive that when we get together and we organize and we actually engage with Congress, um, things, good things can happen. Most of the time when we look at the copyright legislation, Congress is horrible at copyright. They really are. And so they're, but they really need to be educated by people who know what they're talking about. Um, and so, so we can have that effect if we organize and we talk to the right people. And, and uh, 
I, I want to also add that the Internet Archive was also one of the very important players. So, uh, Leela, I don't want you to leave your own organization out because you guys were amazing in that process. Okay, um, just to finish on Tom's question, I, I assume uh, even before the MMA, uh, if someone makes a modern recording of something by Bach, something that's clear, the underlying work is clearly in the uh, public domain, and that the recording they make is clearly owned by them, it's not a work for hire, it's not for a label, uh, then they are perfectly within their rights to post it. Uh, who's going to object? <laughs> uh, and if it is filtered, uh, you go to YouTube or whoever it is that filtered it and object. Uh, that's exactly what happened with some of the ARSC stuff. Uh, I mean, hopefully you don't have to go to court to sue, but it is clearly within, uh, clearly legal to put your own recording of a public domain work uh, anywhere you want. Is, does that pass muster, Leela and Eric? Okay, thumbs up. All right, uh, the next question we get is from Michelle Jahara McKinney. And she asks, uh, someone donated hundreds of live recordings when they were in danger of being lost in a basement. Uh, it sounds like my basement. Uh, they are in the form of reels and need digitizing. Also, the archive wants to make them available online for study and listening, but not download. Would we have to find each musician or his or her heirs? It's a little apart from the MMA, but I think Someone here can probably answer that. So, uh, Leela, did you want to go? I, I can. I can start with this. Um, the, the this gets into a, a, a pretty. This gets into, in my opinion, this gets into some places that are unsettled, and as far as law, because one of the things that the Classics Act didn't change is as far as like it, it didn't fully bring everything under federal copyright it left some elements of the state laws in place one of those being it, one of the one of the, the ch early challenges to, to federalizing pre-1972 recordings came from the record association the riaa which was saying look this is going to be a huge chain of title problem the state laws determine who owns a recording we need that to stay in place so Congress said with the MMA, the person who owns the recording before this is enacted is the person who owns it afterwards. And what that means is that the, the state laws are the ones that determine who owns a recording. Who owns a recording depends on which state you're in. Uh, and the, the, the states are different. So this is, this is a... I'm, I'm sorry to say this, this is a place where I'm going to have to invoke the it depends rule <laughs> and just say like, this is complicated uh, and you might need to talk to someone who uh, can actually counsel you on that. Leila, did you want to add to that? Well, um, I, I mean, Eric, I think is exactly right on the law. It's, it is a mess. Um, so yeah, I, yeah, I'm afraid I don't have a lot of help there other, other than to say that, so, that sounds like the kind of collection that, a DM, that the DMCA might be helpful with, right? Um, if it were digitized and then placed somewhere like a YouTube or the archive or somewhere where they, where it could be available and then you just kind of wait for somebody to complain about it. Like that's a, it doesn't necessarily mean that the institution itself that digitizes it would then get to proudly host it and, but there is fair use. And so I will say that, um, you know, again, if you're a tiny, small institution and you don't have a lawyer, fair use can feel really complicated and difficult, but I don't, so I don't, I, I maybe I missed like, what are these recordings? What is their historical importance? Um, but one of the things you can do to make something much more likely to be fair use is to add a ton of commentary, a ton of context, um, make it an index, make it, you know, put lots of information, import information from Wikipedia that says, you know, this is what this is, contextualize it, really um, make it useful for, uh, for, for digital humanities, right, for, for, um, uh, for 
what do we call it? Meta science, right? Where, where you, you don't, uh, where you do kind of like meta analysis across a large uh, non-consumptive use, they call it in the law, but it's sort of a meaningless term to most people. Um, but there are lots of different ways one can use that kind of a collection once it has been digitized um, that are fair use. And so I would say, think about exploring that maybe with, uh, this is a perfect area for collaboration, maybe with a larger institution, or alternatively, I will say that law clinics, um, there are many, many tech law clinics out there around the country um, that help advise these kinds of projects. When I worked at the Berkeley Clinic, we advised on a historical collection of civil rights documents and materials. Um, these were not sound recordings, but we, we work to get this large trove of materials able to be posted in a way that people had access to most of it. And so thinking about free legal services that you might be able to benefit from um, can, can also potentially be useful and helpful here. And I think we're at time and I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, unfortunately we reached the end of our, our time. Thank you all. Thank you for the panelists. You've been extremely enlightening, I think, and helpful. This will be available on a recording for attendees to review later on. Uh, and we hope we've answered, uh, we've answered some of your questions. So thank you very much and have a good rest of the conference. Bye.